All right, in our second group, we have uh, Ethan Felder and Mike Migliaro. Uh, both of them are running for the assembly in District 28, currently held by assembly member Andrew Hevesy. Ethan Felder is a Democrat, and Mike Conigliaro is a Republican. So welcome both. Um, just like the last one, I'm going to give each of you three minutes to introduce yourselves, and if you can tell us what the top issue you'll take on if elected. So um, I'll let Ethan go first, and then Mike. Sure. Thank you, Thank you Yachting. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I love uh, all that you're doing here at the uh, Asian Wave Alliance. Mm -hmm. I think it's so good that, that new groups are coming into formation right now in this moment, given all that we're dealing with across our city and state uh, right now. I'm Ethan Felder. I'm a local community leader in Forest Hills, and I've decided to, to run for the State Assembly. Um, I am a proud graduate of Townsend Harris High School, and I am fortunate and proud for the accelerated education that I received at Townsend Harris. And I'll say it, it is foundational to who I am and um, and how I'm running my campaign, where we're having students from the school going door to door, talking to voters, engaging in local democracy, because uh, that's the way it ought to be. Um, education uh, and gifted and talent, expanding gifted and talented programs, is on the top of my priorities list right now. But we need to expand these programs um, in every district across the city, period. And we need to um, make sure that there is universal screening to expand and make sure that every uh, student who is gifted and qualified uh, is able to get the instruction and learning that they deserve. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, every student has their needs met. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor. This is my first candidate forum that I've done. Uh, so thank you for having me, and I'm excited for what's to come. Great. Thank you. Mike? Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Canigliaro. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the question as to what my top priority is. Well, there's, there's two main top priorities. Schools, education. I just became the president of CEC 24 and crime, and the issue of finally having a voice in the community to speak up for people, because right now, when you look at the district, uh, there's really no one out there speaking out for anyone when something happens. So you have the issue of um, hate crimes. Well, to stand in front of a camera when something happens and make an issue of it and say that you're going to do things, and then it just gets wiped under the rug and it happens again and again and again, what are you actually going to do as the political leader, as the elected official, to stop it? Is it convenient to vote for defunding the police because that's the political hot topic like it was two years ago, which we're now seeing was a total disaster? We have elected officials calling for, the M for people to come into the subway stations, and they call the MTA to clean it up so they can see that there's nothing wrong down there. Covering it up is not the answer. Taking away the gifted and talented program for students the SHSAT, having politicians use our children as political footballs is unacceptable. Determining and trying to state that certain criteria in our schools are racist when that's just what they believe and what is not the truth is unacceptable. Making sure that we don't have jails built in our neighborhoods, that Rikers Island doesn't close because, again, politicians believe that it should close. No, they want to use that because it's property that could be sold on the water. Money to build community jails can be used to rehabilitate Rikers Island. There's a homeless shelter in Glendale that was built years ago. We fought against that. I worked with the people in Maspeth in 2016. I worked in 2014 to show with the Middle Village Glendale Alliance that that homeless shelter was going to create a problem. Not because we're against homelessness, but because there are solutions rather than shelters. And one thing I would do in the state assembly is initiate a bill to make New York a resident-only state so that the residents of New York, rather than anybody who winds up in New York from anywhere, are taking up services that we should have here. I was born and raised in Kew Gardens, and as a kid, I would walk from Kew Gardens to Austin Street and go to the movies and do things with my friends. People are afraid to do that now. Why? Because they're afraid of crime. They're afraid to take the E train, the F train, the R train. Students 
are afraid for their safety to get to and from school. Then we had the issue of school safety officers in our school. They actually wanted to remove the school safety officers from our schools because they tried to say that they created a police state. Totally untrue. We need to have them in our schools because they help our students, they help our parents, and they're part of the fabric of our school system. So there's many, many things to discuss, but I'm proud to be the candidate. I hope that I can have your support, and you will see and hear from me from day one once I'm elected into the State Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Phil, you want to take yes. the first question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I drive around Queens a lot. Myrtle Avenue, Fresh Pond Road, Queens Boulevard, uh, Woodhaven. Uh, we see hundreds and hundreds of stores, shops, uh, that, that were never able to reopen despite the COVID lockdowns have been lifted. As a result of that, we see thousands, if not tens of thousands of people out of work. And the unemployment figures shows that. New York City has the highest unemployment rate in New York State. What are your ideas to support the economic recovery of New York State and specifically New York City? which has the highest rate of unemployment in the country, as reported recently by the New York Post. Who, who do you want to start? Sure. Well, Phil, thank you for that question. Sure. And I, I have walking down Myrtle Avenue, Woodhaven Boulevard, um, Austin Street, you see exactly what you described. There is a lot of distress out there. And, I, and you hear it and you see it. You, you meet people um, on the street while canvassing who are out of work and are really facing tough times. So, um, we need to make sure that we're opening up fully. That's what I hear from small business owners. So we need to lift the restrictions, those that are in place still, and we need to get the city up and running again. What is central to that right now? And I believe Michael touched on it. Public safety. People need to feel safe and confident riding the subway right now. Without a safe subway, we will not have a recovery, period. That's what it comes down to. I speak to uh, residents, friends, who are rightly and understandably concerned about their safety, walking the streets and taking the subway. That can't be. We need, we need to make sure that we have laws in place to make sure that people who are committing crime after crime with arrest after arrest are where they need to be, and that's not walking our streets and victimizing further. That shouldn't be a controversial statement. That should be sensible. And we need to restore a sense of sensibility and trust in government and our public officials right now. That's why I support entrusting judges with discretion in assessing whether someone poses a danger to the community and whether they should be released from custody when arrested for a crime. Those who can't get behind that sort of common sense idea are only sowing distrust and cynicism um, for, for public officials who are seasoned and entrusted enforcers of the rule of law right now. And we need to make it such that people know that the system is working so that everyone is kept safe and all our communities are kept safe. That to me is the number one issue and that's the number one issue that I hear from voters all around the district from Middle Village to Kew Gardens. Thank you. So Phil, thank you for the question. Um, during the pandemic, tenants had a moratorium on paying rent, but landlords didn't. And landlords still had to pay their real estate tax, their water bills, their insurance bills. They still had to pay their mortgages. So what happens? Tenants in these stores on Austin Street, on Myrtle Avenue, on Fresh Pond Road, on Metropolitan Avenue, closed, can't pay the rent, landlord has to turn around and do what? Evict, but there's a moratorium on that. But the landlord still has to pay. If there were a situation such as a pandemic, again, I would create legislation to say, if you're going to have a moratorium for the tenants, let's have a moratorium for the landlords as well, so that we even the playing field during those times. Secondly, those stores that are vacant, we would see if we can get legislation in to turn around and cap the sales tax for a certain amount of time, be it six months or a year, let a small business owner come in with a little breathing room. At the same time now, these stores would open, the landlord would be able to, to give them a rent that would be affordable, and they would have the ability to turn around and make money to build up their businesses to pay their rents. 
this would help the business open. Now, again, talking about the issue of safety while people are shopping, we have bail reform laws that were put into place in 2019 that have taken our society and brought it from a level of greatness during the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations and brought down back to a level probably worse than the 70s. And that's atrocious. That shouldn't have happened. We had everything right, and then a one-party system failed, all of us. This is no longer a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is a societal issue. The moral fabric of our society, the quality of life has dipped to a point where people are going to Florida. They're leaving here. They're not staying here. They're tired of mask mandates. They're tired of children having to be getting a shot for their uh, for the for the um, for the COVID. They're tired of all this. They're tired of being told this is what you're going to do. We're defunding the police. You, you know, criminals are turning around. They're going into Walgreens. They're going into CVS. They're picking a shelf. They're filling a bag. They're leaving. And guess what? These stores can't afford to keep re re-shelfing, re-putting stuff on the shelf, so they close. It's a domino effect. Now that landlord loses a tenant, that neighborhood loses jobs, and guess what? It's because of bail reform, because the same criminal comes out the next day and says, I'm going to rob you again. So you have to take the handcuffs off the police, put them back on the criminals. I believe we should have a transit police system once again in the subway system, as we did up until the 1995 Giuliani transition where everyone became one unit. I also believe that at the same time, if we take that, if we now repeal bail reform and give judges the right to make decisions for these violent criminals as to whether or not they should be put back on the streets, we will protect these store owners from being robbed and having the fear of opening in an area because they see that the crime has become prevalent. You have to create safety, but you also have to create a comfortable financial situation for a tenant coming in so that these stores can be reopened, but they can be reopened with all issues covered. And those are the main things that we look to do to help rebuild our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, um, next question is, what are your thoughts on the clean slate bill? And do you support it, oppose it? What would you propose, any, or would you propose any changes to it? Um, for the audience uh, who may not be familiar, the clean slate bill automatically seals the records of misdemeanor convictions three years after the imposition of a sentence. And certain felony records after seven years will be wiped. Um, this does not apply if the person is on parole or probation. There are some caveats. About 2.3 million New Yorkers have a conviction record which would block, block them from housing or economic opportunities. So I wanted to hear what you thought of the Clean Slate Bill. And I think that is actually being weighed in in Albany um, this session. But, you know, they tried it last uh, term at the very end. It did not pass. They're trying again this term. So do you support it? Do you oppose it? And what would you change about it? Yeah. Sure. Okay. You start first and then... So I think before you have the Clean Slate Bill passed, you have to take care of repealing the bail reform bill first. I think that one would allow, once you give the judges again that discretion, because once you start being able to seal records, and I understand there are people who say, well, why can't I get a job You know, if, if my record is not? I think you have to look at that bill and say, what were the offenses that you're going to look to seal on the misdemeanor side? On the felony side, again, you have to look at it, but I'm not an advocate of that being passed until we know that the bail reform bill has been repealed first. Because if a judge needs to use the discretion to determine whether or not someone should be let out on bail, and there isn't any information that they could look back to, and it all falls back to what we used to have called the broken windows theory of policing, where if somebody jumped the turnstile, if someone did a minor crime and they were able, a police officer was able to go into the system and look to see if that person had a record, well, that would allow them to do that. The clean slate bill would actually close off some information on that. And I don't think at this stage of the game that would be helpful. So I wouldn't be supportive of that until I knew that we had bail reform repealed and the judges had the discretion and authority. Then I would look to see if in the Clean Act bill we looked at the crimes they were looking to determine as to what would be sealed and not. And I think you have to look at that very closely and not make it a blanket, but rather a specified group to see what would work best for the, our society. Thank you. I haven't come out specifically uh, on, that, on that bill. I'm certainly going to take a look. I think we need to make sure that uh, people are getting 
uh, the mental health services that they deserve. Good. So that there, whatever we can do to, so that people aren't committing crimes and aren't victimizing people and finding themselves in place, horrific places like Rikers. Good. And I am someone um, who has set foot as a lawyer uh, on Rikers. It is not a place we want anyone to be if we could prevent it, prevent them from being there. Yeah. And we do a lot to try in terms of diversionary programs. We need to make sure that people, it's expensive, but people get the mental health services they need in order to get up on their feet. <laughs> After they've done their time, society should not be punitive. The purpose of criminal justice and punishment is to deter further crimes from being committed. So once you've paid your debt to society, we need to make sure that you can get a job, that you're not prevented from getting a job on account of being in prison, being in jail. Same thing with housing. Yeah. We need to make sure that people can find housing yeah. so that we don't have this permanent underclass of people that are uh, cycling through prisons. So I think that, yes, there is something to making sure that people have second chances in order to ensure that they could live sustaining, fulfilling, meaningful lives and get back up on their feet. Yes, I am under no illusions. There are people out there who are uh, career criminals, and the system needs to take care of that, and they should be jailed. No doubt about it. But there are certainly a whole lot of people that can make their way back into the mainstream of society, and we as a state need to do the best that we can in order to foster that. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> one minute each. <laughs> All right. um, May Mayor Dilbo, the Mill, Bill de Blasio cancel the gifted and talented programs in New York City public school systems. There was immense outcry from the Asian community. What are your ways or the ways you would support need-based education such as gifted and talented programs statewide? One minute each. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Phil. And it just has to be said that this notion that I that the mayor put out there that we cannot have inclusive, gifted, and talented programs that serve all students is a detestable notion. <laughs> that there are not um, students, minority students, in all different parts of the city and all different districts that would benefit uh, and should benefit from gifted and talented programs is one uh, that. Uh, is, is so wrong-headed. Um, we need to make sure that we have a, a system in place, um, not what the, necessarily what the mayor is trying to do with just enriched learning, but we need pro gifted and talented programs that are ex not just expanded, but screen appropriately through objective criteria to make sure that every gifted and qualified student is able to have their needs met educationally. Um, I'm a huge proponent of gifted and talented programs. I will continue to advocate for that. And um, I think, uh, you know, as someone who has, was in an accelerator program, I was with people from all, students from all different backgrounds. Um, it was, it, I, at Townsend Harris, it wasn't such that we were in some sort of so-called segregated school setting. Yeah, I think that that's an abhorrent way to think about it. And uh, we need to make sure that we are proud of the uh, gifted and talented programs that we've had for some time and that we need to expand upon. Yeah. <clears throat> My take is a little different. Um, gifted and talented programs are titled gifted and talented because there are students who are gifted and talented. I don't believe that there is a racial inequity when it comes to the gifted and talented program because if there's a criteria that you have to meet, same with an SHSAT, uh, same with any, if you if you want to take, for example, to go to law school, you take the LSAT, you have to meet a certain grade to get into that school. If you don't meet that grade, then you don't get into that school. Gifted and talented programs as a criteria. If you start leveling the playing field because you want to use that there's a racial inequity issue, and you now have students that really aren't at the same level of someone who is um, rightfully deserving to be in a gifted and talented program, you're going to create a system where more children may wind up dropping out, where they may wind up feeling that they don't belong in that class, they're going to have self-esteem issues, they're going to have problems because now the student who is in that gifted and talented program may have to assist the student who isn't and now Tom's going to be have to take him from that student to help the other. Now I'm not saying that 
there is not the ability for students to take certain classes or to do certain things to prep or do whatever to get in. But what I'm saying is that if you start creating lotteries and you start creating this level where anybody can get in, you're taking away from the whole aspect of that program. A gifted and talented program is exactly that. And I do believe that even if you go in honors programs throughout each grade and you have if you get on the honor roll, you get on the honors program in the sixth grade, in the seventh grade, in every grade, and you can show students that have that ability too, fine, but you must meet the criteria to be entitled to do that. And I don't mean it as entitlement, I mean the reason being for having that specific exam or specific criteria is to determine whether or not you are eligible and qualified to be in that program. And one quick thing, just the other day, I had a question asked to me at a meeting to say, well, if the school is in a bad neighborhood, how can that student excel? The bad neighborhood doesn't define the school. The student who's in school defines how they're going to do in school. So you can't say because the school's in a bad neighborhood that that student's not going to get a quality education. I don't buy that. <coughs> Same thing with the zoning issues. If your school is zoned for your students to go there, then why should a student from Forest Hills have to travel to East New York when they belong in the school in Forest Hills? Simply for reasons of after-school projects, being able to assimilate with the friends in your neighborhood, to do projects after school, to become part of after-school activities. There's a lot of things involved in these decisions, and we have to realize that we're dealing with children. And if we don't have these specific issues handled the right way now, you're dealing with a child's ability and their self-esteem throughout life, and we don't want to mess with that, especially at a young, tender age. So I believe it should continue the way it is. We can talk about other grades and, and, and honors programs, but we need to keep it the way it is for the specific reasons I mentioned. Thank you. If I could offer just a, a little bit of a response. Um, what I would say is uh, that the research shows that um, there is, it's certainly possible uh, to build uh, inclusive, gifted, and talented programs. If we look at the researchers out of South Florida, Broward County, uh, Card and Giuliano did a whole study. I'm uh, impressed. Where um, <laughs> they doubled the number of Latino and African American students in the gifted and talented programs in that part of the state. So I agree with Michael, the importance of gifted and talented but we do need gifted and talented programs that reach out to all communities so that every student who is qualified, and there are many students who are not uh, properly identified for gifted and talented programs, are able to reap the rewards and the benefits of that sort of programming and education. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that is all the time we have. Um, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, thank you so much, you. Ethan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both of them are running in District uh, 28 for the Assembly seat. So if you're a Democrat, uh, consider Ethan. If you're a Republican, consider Mike for the June primary. Thank you so much. And by the way, I have no primary in June. So. Oh, well. <laughs> consider me the general. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank 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 you.